Americans, and over 95% of the respondents said that they had a positive view of the Army as a result of having visited the U.S. Army. So, the military has been investing in some unexpected strategies. A huge one? Video games. Video games now represent the biggest entertainment medium in human history. Around 65% of Americans play video games, 38% of which are between the age of 18 and 34, with over half being men. By the end of 2022, the US Army had missed its recruitment goal by 25% and is expected to see declining enlistment rates for the foreseeable future. With this in mind, the Army, along with other branches of the US military, have long identified the potential to recruit this huge share of the American population, united by a love of video games, and over the past few decades, they've spent millions of dollars to do it. The gaming community represents a surplus of people at the perfect age for recruitment. The shooter genre has long been the most popular in the industry, and video games themselves very often require players to be cooperative and be part of a collective bigger than themselves. The gamer demographic is a military recruiter's gold mine. The US military have used video games for their own means much longer than you might expect. In 1963, the US Defense Department created a game called Stage, standing for simulation of total atomic global exchange. The project was created as political propaganda during the Cold War, as it was designed to show how the United States would win a nuclear war against the Soviet Union. In this instance however, video game is a term I use very loosely. Fast forward to 1980, and the army would now identify video games as a potential training tool. Atari's first person tank game, Battlezone, would be singled out for this exact purpose, and with another 3 months of development time, the company would produce a modified version called the Bradley Trainer, named after the Bradley fighting vehicle the game depicts. A handful of developers at Atari would refuse to work on the project on ethical grounds, and in the end, only two units were ever produced. Just how the 90s ushered in a golden age of video games, the US military saw this as an opportunity to double down on using the medium as a training tool. The 94 shooter, Doom 2, was identified as the perfect candidate for a military coat of paint, and over two years, at the request of the Marine Corps, the popular sequel would be modified to become Marine Doom, a military fire team simulation. The apocalyptic setting was replaced with a desert landscape, and the demon enemies were now replaced with scans of G.I. Joe action figures. The game saw teams of four players, made up of a team leader, two riflemen, and a machine gunner, accomplish a specific mission, such as destroying an enemy bunker, or rescue a hostage within a foreign embassy. The purpose of Marine Deem wasn't to teach Marines how to fire weapons, but rather how to work as a team and to make split-second decisions in the heat of combat. In particular, there was a heavy emphasis on mutual fire team support, the proper sequencing of an attack, ammunition discipline, and the succession of command. Marine Doom was designed to supplement the lack of live training opportunities with a cost-effective solution. In 1997, GT Interactive acquired the rights to publish the game commercially. In 1999, the US military's stance toward video games would once again be changed forever. The story goes that an army colonel by the name of Casey Wardinsky was with his family in Best Buy and noticed that his three children would be fixated on the game section of the store. Wardinsky realized that the medium of video games had an enormous pull on the youth of America and that games themselves could become a vehicle for recruitment. As it turned out, Casey Wardinsky wasn't just any US Army colonel, but the Army's chief economist and a professor at the United States Military Academy. Put simply, he was someone who had a lot of sway to pitch unconventional ideas. Wardinsky would propose that the Army develop and publish a video game with the aim to provide the public with a way to virtually explore the Army at their own pace. It would be the first video game developed as a recruitment tool.
on the 4th of July, 2002, America's Army was finally released to the world, a first-person shooter, which players could download entirely free of charge, and the timing couldn't be more perfect. The first Battlefield game was still a month from release, and the first Call of Duty title wouldn't be finished until the end of the following year, and when shooters at the time were all trending toward the popular backdrop of World War II, an ultra-realistic modern setting was the perfect alternative. The term, ultra-realistic, should also be underlined, as America's Army was the first ever game to feature Unreal Engine 2, the predecessor to what many consider today as the best looking game engine in the business. We should also mention that the game released less than a year after 9-11, which led to the highest level of recruitment since World War II. In a strange twist of fate, the biggest driver of downloads for this game may have been Al-Qaeda. The game itself was a round-based tactical shooter, where two teams of up to 14 players would compete over a single objective, such as crossing a bridge or even securing an oil pipeline. We can't make this shit up. The combat itself was described by reviewers at the time as very realistic, as players would only take one or two shots before going limp, which would require a team member to offer medical treatment. However, in order to assume the role of a medic in the first place, players must pass a virtual medical training course, based on actual training, that would be taught within the army. This wasn't some hold F to revive teammate shit either. For the control bleeding segment for example, players would be required to sit through a 10 minute demonstration, voiced by a real army lecturer, using real world photographs, who would explain the entire process of how to stem bleeding from a wound. Just in case you thought you might be able to leave the room and let the segment play out, players would then be required to pass a test at the end of the class, ensuring that they retained the information. The entire course would also cover how to evaluate and prioritize casualties, recognize and treat shock, and how to administer aid when a victim wasn't breathing. In the game's defense, these segments would eventually lead to two confirmed cases of players administering life-saving treatment from what they learned in-game, one of which receiving national media attention. This kind of in-game training wasn't limited to being a medic either, as much of the game's features were held back behind similar educational segments. Players who wanted to use the Javelin missile launcher needed to take a lengthy course on how to properly use one, and then correctly identify and fire upon a number of valid military targets. Similarly, parachute training would give the player access to airborne missions, while special forces training would unlock special forces content. The Special Forces tutorial would test the player on how to identify certain aircraft and armored units, then much like the medic training, make players take a test to see whether they were paying attention. In the modern gaming industry, which often seeks to nickel and dime customers at every turn, it's almost refreshing to see a game force its players to become more recruitable as a soldier, as opposed to making them reach into their wallet. America's Army was a critical success, winning 33 awards following its release, including 5 Guinness World Records, and one gaming site calling it quote, the best misappropriation of tax dollars ever. The game would ultimately cost 7.5 million to produce, which was just over 0.3% of the Army's marketing budget at the time, but the results spoke for themselves. 20% of incoming West Point trainees had played America's Army before starting basic training, and according to an MIT study in 2008, the game had positively influenced 30% of young civilians' views on the Army. Considering an M1 Abrams tank costed around $5 million at the time, America's Army would prove to be an incredibly valuable investment for the US military. Obviously after such a wild success, the army would commission sequels for this direct line into the gaming youth of America, and by the 6th of November, 2003, America's Army Special Forces was born. The only video game developed by the world's premier land force, the United States Army. More of an update to the original title. Supposedly the game was in response to the Department of Defense, wanting to double its number of Special Forces soldiers, and these orders simply trickled down the chain of command, until it reached the developers. Shortly after its completion, the army would sign a 10-year contract with Ubisoft of all companies, in a bid to reach a wider, and even younger audience. 
America's Army, Rise of a Soldier, would be released exclusively on the original Xbox and would feature a single player campaign where the player would start as a recruit and work their way up to become a special forces soldier. In true US Army fashion, the game featured a mission which involved defending an oil field from terrorists and just to make it abundantly clear, this game was entirely funded by the US government. The title would go on to receive average reviews. The third main installment would be released in 2009, and by this time, the war in Afghanistan had nearly reached its halfway point. The perception toward the war had shifted, Obama had just entered the White House, and the gaming world was just months away from playing Assassin's Creed 2, Modern Warfare 2, and the original Borderlands. This wasn't to say that America's Army 3 didn't change with the times, with the game now being remade in Unreal Engine 3, making medical training compulsory and removing jumping entirely to combat the previous century's bunny hopping problem. America's Army 3 didn't quite get the warm reception of its initial entry, and with the shooter genre evolving so much over the past decade, an army recruitment tool in disguise was going to struggle against its much fiercer competition. In a tragic turn for the franchise, America's Army 3 was released on the exact same day as Armor 2, a game which filled the same ultra-realistic niche and generally scored much higher. In 2022, support for the original America's Army was finally retracted by the army and the servers were subsequently shut down. The legacy of the world's first video game recruitment tool is about as mixed as you might imagine. In 2018, GameSpot called it one of the 50 most important PC games of all time, and within the US government, other departments would go on to adopt the concept to develop training tools for other roles. America's Army would also weather its fair share of critics over its lifetime, with many condemning the game for contributing to the militarization of society and for targeting an increasingly younger audience. At the end of the day, the game was used within schools and was specifically targeted toward children with the intent to bolster army recruitment numbers, which likely didn't sit well with many parents of America. With video game hysteria at its peak, it's a wonder that a game literally designed as army propaganda didn't fall victim to angry suburban mothers across the country. With the shuttering of America's army, viewers might be inclined to think that the age of using video games as a vehicle for recruitment were finally over, but the truth is that it never fucking ended. But first, sponsor time. Unlike many of you degenerates, I don't have the luxury of watching the world renown this month's news without the bullshit series to keep up with the news. Instead, I tend to spend a lot of time listening to news podcasts while I'm shopping, cleaning, or recreating the torture scene from Reservoir Dogs, which is why I can't help but recommend Raycon. My Raycon, everyday earbuds, have become as glued to my hip as my keys or wallet, and with 8 full hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life, I've sometimes gone 2 whole months without charging them at all. Not only is Raycon half the price of other premium offerings, but they come with all the features you'd expect from any high quality earbuds, such as noise isolation, sound profiles, and extensive touch features. Raycon are almost zealously confident in their products, because if you're even 1% unsatisfied, you can return them for a full refund any time in the first 30 days. They hold themselves to a high standard and expect their customers to do the same. Going to buyraycon.com forward slash swag will get you a tidy 15% discount on your purchase, but because I'm such a cool guy, I've left a handy link in the description to save you the effort. Raycon. The YouTuber's choice. In 2018, the United States Army missed its recruitment goals for the first time in 13 years, and in an effort to modernize its outreach efforts, US Army Esports was born. The Army concluded that many game enthusiasts tended to follow and idolize professional players at the highest level, and so by fostering their own teams from their own ranks, they could compete against the best in the world and win some of that magic for themselves. The army even designed two 18-wheeler trucks to be mobile gaming trailers decked out with PCs, consoles, and even VR headsets. Part of this outreach program involved the creation of an official US Army eSports Twitch channel 
and as you may have guessed, the creators would face very unique challenges that would never be a problem for regular streamers. Most notably, the Discord server and Twitch channel were flooded with people making memes and comments referencing war crimes committed by the United States, which led to a temporary freeze on new people joining the Discord server, as well as a number of Twitch commenters being banned. Being the US Army, banning users wasn't nearly as simple as the average Joe, streaming with a Logitech webcam, and the American Civil Liberties Union would argue that their actions violated the First Amendment. In July 2020, a draft amendment was filed to the House Appropriations Bill that would prohibit the US military from having a presence on Twitch or any other video game streaming platform. The amendment was shot down. But the attention garnered from the controversy would hold the entire Twitch channel for nearly a month. There was also an incident where the army was accused of promoting fake giveaways, as the links provided to enter would instead direct viewers toward a recruitment form. What? As of time of writing, the army's stint into esports appears to have become much less advertised, and their official Twitch channel hasn't been active for seven months. The most recent part of this decades old pipeline, from gamer to soldier, is much more subtle, and as a result, is much harder to prove. Our last section, is going to focus entirely, on Call of Duty. As arguably one of the franchises, that would end up killing America's army, it might seem strange for the US military, to team up with their biggest competitor in the gaming scene, but after all, the army were never after players, they wanted soldiers. In July 2021, Activision Blizzard, the owners of the Call of Duty franchise, would face the start of a long and lengthy workplace harassment scandal, which would lead to a loss of many of the company's sponsors, including none other than the United States Army, which was planning an aggressive marketing campaign. According to internal documents obtained by Motherboard, the US Army had planned to sponsor streamers, content creators, and Call of Duty games themselves as part of a recruitment drive, and as someone somewhat familiar with these campaigns, they weren't fucking around. The campaign plan revealed that $200,000 would be allocated to Call of Duty Mobile, which includes rewarding in-game currency to players who watch Army ads. 300,000 would also be allocated for resports organization, Optic Chicago, which was estimated to return 10 million impressions. Most interesting however, was 150,000, allocated to YouTube creator, Stone Mountain 64 who boasts over 2 million subscribers on the platform. Up until now, all of these intended transactions have been documented, but here's when things get a bit more tinfoil hatty. This is because, we now get into the content of the Call of Duty games themselves, and whether some of the creative decisions, were on the part of the developers, or whether there may have been military related money men pulling the strings. OBJECTION! Of course, it likely sounds ridiculous, that the United States government would want to influence the creative outcomes for a first person shooter series, but when you look at everything we know, it seems to be a logical step. The US military has long used Hollywood to sharpen its public image and boost recruitment, and for film producers, painting American troops in a good light is an easy way to score access to tons of expensive military hardware. To the Pentagon, getting cozy with film producers is a cheap and effective way to market themselves, and with video games now being the biggest entertainment industry of all time, it would be insane to think that the US military wouldn't want a piece of the action. If this still isn't convincing, then we need only to look at Activision Blizzard's higher management to raise even more eyebrows. First up we have the company's chief legal officer, Grant Dixton. Mr. Dixton had previously held the position as the senior vice president of the Boeing company, the third largest defense contractor in the world, but before that, he served in the White House as associate counsel to the president. We then have Francis Townsend, who served as senior counsel since October 2022. Before joining Activision Blizzard, Townsend served as the assistant for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism to President George Bush, and in 2017, she was shortlisted to the director of the FBI. Townsend has publicly defended the use of torture as part of the US government's war on terror. The third member of this list is Activision Blizzard's chief administrative officer, Brian Blatow. 
Before landing a job at the company, Mr. Blatow was a captain in the U.S. Army, but would later become the chief operating officer at the CIA. At this point, you might be noticing a pattern, with all three of these executives coming from a government security background, and all three of them having no previous experience in the video game industry. This still doesn't prove anything, but their close involvement sure does make a person wonder. The reason I'm mentioning this at all is because a Call of Duty franchise has gained a reputation of always making America the very clear good guys, and although this isn't exactly new to the entertainment industry, the series has often distorted the truth and arguably attempted to rewrite history. In 2019's Modern Warfare, there's a mission called Highway of Death, in which the player sets up an ambush along a key highway in a fictional Middle Eastern country. In the game's story, the highway was heavily bombed by Russian forces prior to the attack, but this was far from the truth when looking at the mission's historical inspiration. The Highway of Death was a real-world event during the Gulf War, where upon spotting a huge number of vulnerable Iraqi armor on a six-lane highway between Kuwait and Iraq, US and Allied troops would bomb the road, leading to the destruction of thousands of vehicles. The attack itself was incredibly controversial, as the highway was also being used by civilians and refugees, and it was even argued that the soldiers themselves weren't even legitimate targets, as they weren't in combat. The similarities to the in-game events are striking to say the least, and many Russian citizens criticize the game for making their country the villain for an event named after a real-life war crime committed by the United States. If this is perhaps too subtle, then let's fast forward to 2022's Modern Warfare 2, where the game's opening mission sees the player assassinate Russian-backed Iranian leader, General Gobrani. Long-time viewers of our new series may see a striking resemblance to real-world Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, who was assassinated by US missile strike at the start of 2020, the same way his counterpart is killed in-game. As we covered at the time, Qasem Soleimani was a figure as complex as he was controversial and was seen as an ISIS-fighting national hero domestically, but a terrorist himself in the eyes of the US government. The assassination was widely condemned as an unnecessary escalation, and scholars argued that the strike was a clear violation of international law. To even the most casual of player, it's not hard to notice how much the franchise tends to hype up the US Army and present a gritty justification for an excessive use of force. We haven't even mentioned the Modern Warfare 2 mission, where you have to subdue civilians at the end of a barrel, or how a villain in Call of Duty Ghosts is seemingly modeled after Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, and this isn't even to mention the ending of Black Ops 1. Mason! It is over. We won. For now. Which speaks for itself. Of course, I should once again reiterate that there's absolutely no concrete evidence that the US government is paying Activision Blizzard to make these creative decisions within their games. Even with the presence of the suspiciously high number of ex-high-ranking government officials on the executive payroll, this could very well be entirely coincidental. After all, Call of Duty campaigns offer a fantasy of fighting for the good guys, with some of the best soldiers in the world, and when the game is made by Americans, for the western market, it makes sense to make the story more black and white, good and evil. After all, I myself was accused of being paid by Activision Blizzard when I said I really liked playing Overwatch 2, and although I wouldn't blame anyone for believing it, my review certainly didn't make my pockets any heavier. At the end of the day, Overwatch just makes my monkey brain happy. I've been making news content on YouTube for 4 years now, and I've never had this many tabs open for a single story, regardless of what I've covered. The US military is the biggest employer in the United States, has a budget of around 800 billion dollars, and has access to tools and resources that any other organization would only dream of having. Since the humble first steps of the video game industry, the US military has kept a keen interest in the medium, consistently wondering how these new experiences can be used in the service of Uncle Sam. As interesting as it is to look back at how video games have shaped the recruiting habits of the strongest military force ever assembled, I can't help but ponder the ethics of doing so and the next step in this decades-long campaign. 
the United States government has been targeting children and teenagers through this medium, going back to the start of the millennia, in an attempt to make them the next generation of patriotic US soldiers. Whether that's any different to what Michael Bay's Transformers did in 2007, or Disney propaganda during World War II, is a question you can answer for yourself. Whatever the case, video games are likely going to be a much bigger part of the US military's recruitment strategy going forward, and only time will tell as to how this tradition will evolve. After all, as the classic tagline of the Call of Duty series goes, there's a soldier in all of us.